So we now invite Curtis Roman, the Sen Senior Director of the Aboriginal Interpreter Service, to discuss perspectives of interpreting. Thanks, Curtis. No worries. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, interpreting uh, services that we provide as well as the interpreter service generally. Um, so the Aboriginal Interpreter Service has been around for a little over 20 years. Um, it's the only, uh, my understanding is that it's the only government provider of uh, Aboriginal interpreting services in Australia. We provide one-to-one uh, -one interpreting services, uh, interpreters for community meetings and gatherings. Uh, we provide uh, recorded messages in anti-Aboriginal languages. And we also uh, deliver working with interpreter training uh, to service providers. Um, now, the working with interpreter training uh, is really important because a lot of people have never worked with interpreters before and uh, they need to understand how to work with an interpreter to get the most out of working with interpreters, um, not only for themselves, their staff and their service delivery, but also for um, Aboriginal language speaking clients. Um, so often people will do things as talk too fast, they'll use acronyms, um, they'll maintain focus with the, on the interpreter rather than the client. Um, they won't allow the interpreter time to uh, think through concepts and then explain them in their own language. So working with interpreter training is really important uh, for us to create awareness about the importance of um, engaging interpreters and also how to work with interpreters to get the best outcomes for clients. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, we don't need interpreters because um, we use our staff or we use family members or we use friends um, and those people are not interpreters. They're not trained interpreters. They're not qualified interpreters. Um, you can't ensure that the, uh, uh, there's accuracy. Uh, you can't ensure that there's impartiality. You can't ensure that they're maintaining, uh, maintaining confidentiality. Um, a whole range of reasons why it's in the service provider's best interest uh, to use uh, trained and qualified interpreters um, in the Northern Territory. Um, often people will say, well, we've worked with Aboriginal people for a long time, so we know how to communicate with them. Um, there is really um, no way for them to gauge that, um, given that Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory will often speak English or get by in English as a fourth or fifth language um, or a fifth or sixth language, and oftentimes uh, do not formally uh, learn how to use English. Um, so there's a range of reasons there that we need to create awareness about why it's important to, as I said, use interpreters and to find out how to use interpreters uh, correctly. Um, we also make it um, clear to our service providers and our clients that our interpreters, as I said, they're trained and qualified interpreters. They're not cultural advisors. Um, that's not their role. They're not liaison officers. They are there to explain professional concepts. That's the role of the service provider to do that through the interpreter. So if service providers have Aboriginal liaison officers already, that's their job to work with the interpreter to provide information to Aboriginal clients. Um, we have approximately 60 full-time staff across the Northern Territory and um, approximately 200 casual interpreters. Uh, we provide interpreting for 18 of the most commonly used Aboriginal languages in the Northern Territory. We have offices located in Darwin, Catherine, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Wadai, um, Nolanboy Gove and Warimianga on the Tiwi Islands. Um, most of our work is done in, in law and uh, justice and in health areas. Uh, we've recently won a Chief Minister's Award for Excellence uh, uh, for the work that we've done on um, COVID-19. So we have a recordings area that does recorded messages um, in Aboriginal languages, uh, small team, 
uh, they were able to meet demand, uh, constant changes and messages, and do that in 18 of the most uh, commonly used languages in the Northern Territory. And they thoroughly deserved uh, that award. Um, we don't do, uh, we don't provide services in written languages um, for a number of reasons. Um, in the Northern Territory, um, you know, languages, uh, I suppose, like everywhere, were verbal. They were part of an oral society. Um, and in the Northern Territory, uh, people don't learn to read their languages. So there's a lot more reach we can get um, when we do recorded messages. Um, uh, so um, we uh, recruit interpreters. We have a team that go out and recruit interpreters and they work with our training team to get our interpreters to level three. Uh, and once our interpreters have reached the AIS level three, we work with uh, NATI uh, to prepare them for um, national certification testing. Um, and uh, we work very well with NATI. Um, we have a range of challenges that we need to get through on a daily basis. Um, uh, some of these, as I said, are services, service providers not understanding the difference between uh, trained and qualified interpreters and language um, speakers. Um, our interpreters are trained to be ethical, are trained to maintain confidentiality, are trained to be impartial and are trained to abide with accuracy. And they also receive training in health and they receive training in uh, uh, legal interpreting. So our interpreters need to be able to um, satisfy requirements that we have for them to be able to provide interpreting services uh, in healthcare and in courts. Um, we have a range of cross-cultural challenges um, that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, for example, our interpreting workforce, uh, Aboriginal people who are a part of traditional communities. So their traditional obligations are always going to be their priority and take precedence. And we need to work with them around those things. Um, and these can in include important things such as gender, age, for example, you might, uh, you know, an older man might not want a younger woman providing interpreting services for them. And we have to consider these things when it comes to a range of areas uh, in healthcare and other areas such as domestic violence. Um, we need to consider not just the English names, uh, but the Aboriginal names and date of birth when we are sourcing interpreters uh, to provide interpreting services for the issue I've just mentioned. Uh, we need to take into consideration and work through things such as avoidance relationships. So people may have avoidance relationships with people and therefore they may not be able to um, be in the same uh, room with them. They may not be able to talk directly to those people. Um, and therefore we need to ensure that um, we have enough interpreters to get around those issues. Other things include uh, poison relationships where people uh, may not be able to talk about body parts um, and other um, body issues, um, relationship issues um, to people from the opposite gender if they have uh, poison relationships with those people. And these um, uh, uh, vary between different communities. So in the Northern Territory, there are lots of different Aboriginal communities, uh, different Aboriginal cultures, different Aboriginal languages. Uh, and there's no one guide to saying, this is how you deal with any of those groups. And there is no one guide to saying, this is how you deal with those groups in Western settings. So we've just got to be able to work through those issues, uh, maintain good relationships with service providers and maintain good relationships with our interpreting workforce. Um, we have other issues, for example, um, such as uh, interpreters being blamed for participating in legal proceedings or even being blamed for the outcomes of legal proceedings if the outcomes of those proceedings don't go the way individuals in one community uh, may want them to. 
um, which can be intimidating for interpreters. So we need to make sure that we are working with them and providing them with the support that they need uh, to continue to provide these services in these contexts. Uh, similarly, in healthcare settings, um, uh, there is a, a, a cultural view up here uh, among Aboriginal people that if somebody um, who is, for example, providing end of life interpreting, which can go on for weeks, um, does mention uh, a particular terminal illness, um, that they can be blamed for um, transmitting that illness to the person who is um, sick. Um, so we have to deal with those cultural issues. Um, and the important thing there is making sure that our interpreters are supported um, constantly and having ongoing open communication with them to ensure that that is the case. Uh, because often interpreters will say, no, no, they're okay. Um, when actually they are feeling a little bit uh, distressed by some of the uh, interpreting assignments they've had to uh, provide. So looking after our interpreter workforce is really important um, and ensuring that they are able to um, provide interpreting services um, when needed. And that means, as I said, looking after them. The other issues we have is that interpreters in the Northern Territory um, will often have uh, transient lifestyles, living between communities, living between Darwin, living between Alice Springs and their communities. And uh, so maintaining um, contact and communication with them is very important um, for when we need to contact them, particularly for urgent situations. Um, we've done a whole range of um, uh, interpreting assignments. Some of those include uh, providing information to the community uh, by way of live press conferences. Um, and these relate to things such as cyclones, um, floods, uh, and these sorts of um, things where we just need somebody to front up to those press conferences uh, with senior uh, people at short notice. Uh, so we need to, as I said, make sure that our interpreters are confident, they're trained, that we're working with them to identify the areas that they want to develop their confidence and they want to be trained in. Um, so that comes back to having that open uh, relationship with them. Um, so it's really important, I suppose, that in the Northern Territory and in other places that we have uh, a strong interpreting service. Um, in the Northern Territory, Aboriginal people comprise a little over 30% of the NT population. Um, and Aboriginal language speakers in the Northern Territory typically do not learn English. Um, often they will grow up learning their mother's language and their father's language, depending on where they're raised and the situation around their parenting. Um, a neighbouring community language, then they'll learn, uh, speak Creole, uh, and then they'll speak in Aboriginal English, uh, and they may use English after that, um, when they're dealing with people who aren't a part of their communities and language groups. So it's a really important service, um, very unique service, uh, very unique uh, in terms of the, uh, the services that we provide uh, and very unique in terms of the workforce uh, and the issues that we have to deal with in terms of uh, looking after that workforce on a daily basis. Um, so that's all, that's all I've got. Thank you, Curtis, for explaining what I'm sure is not all of the complexity, um, but just just some of it there. 